You know, tonight we will be speaking about the two sacraments of uh, vocation, I like to call them, although in the um, Catechism of the Catholic Church they call them the sacraments of service. Uh, and in a sense... Uh, why, why are they called the sacraments of service? Well, because in a sense both of them, you know, um, we had a question posed to us, how are the sacraments of holy orders and matrimony related? And um, they're related in a sense that they the sacrament gives those individuals who receive it a special type of grace to be in service mm. to certain peoples mm. in their lives. Okay, and to yeah. the ones whom God is calling them to serve. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, you know, in the case of holy orders, um, you know, whether you are ordained a deacon or a mm. priest or a bishop, and we'll talk about the different right. orders and levels, but um, in the case of clergy being ordained, mm. um, their work with people is more efficacious because of the grace of that sacrament. Mm -hmm. You know, and in the case of especially of priests and of bishops, um, you're looking at something that we call uh, the priest when he performs a sacrament um, it's in persona Christi Capitus. Oh yeah, we're going to talk yeah. a lot about that today I'll bet. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that it's important that we talk about that because yeah. uh, some people might have the wrong idea mm -hmm. um, other people probably have the right idea of it but there's certainly plenty that we can talk about why, um, why in particular the priest has that. And of course a bishop is a priest first, typically, um, hmm. is a priest first, and it wasn't always that way, um, but the bishop, you know, can celebrate. He has the, yeah. the priestly orders, but he has the fullness right, of the right. orders as well. Something I wanted to say that hit me about the sacraments of service, mm -hmm. um, I've had a spiritual director before who, back uh, when, when I was at Franciscan University, and we talk about vocational stuff, and he would always reinforce the idea that your vocation is not about making you happy. Uh, and he would always tell that to me, you know, because I would say, well, I, I, I'm kind of thinking about the, the priesthood thing, but I just don't know if I see myself as, as being happy. And said, so it's not about whether you think you'll be happy. It's about whether God's asking you to do it. And your vocation is about how God is calling you to love, not how he's not how he wants you to feel all warm and fuzzy inside, but how he's calling you to love. And, um, and I think that the catechism's emphasis on service drives that point home, that it's about these two sacraments, holy orders of ordaining a priest and matrimony of marrying two people. It's, it's not about, I mean, it's about the person, yes, insofar as it's about his, his or her relationship with God and other people, but it's, it's about serving others. Exactly. And um, uh, the unfortunate thing is that for many, many years, prior to Vatican II, many years, um, when people wanted to get married, they went and saw the priest, and they wrote up the paperwork, and then they got married. Uh, and there was no marriage prep. Hmm. There was no sitting down and going through um, uh, the uh, documents that need to be set up in questions that need to be asked of the two individuals. And so it misses the point of what you said, mm. is that it's not whether I'm going to be happy at this, it's whether or not I'm going to do, be, receive this sacrament in order to fulfill and complete God's will. Right. You know, if I was right. meant to be, which I was, meant to be married, uh, and I am happily married for 49 years, and it, at times, was not easy. Um, you know, both my wife and I um, had to live through some hard times. I mean, we'd sort of joke about it. Um, you know, th those were times when we were poor. We would talk about times we were poor. Um, and we were. I mean, we did not have a lot. Um, and uh, there was a time I had to work three jobs. Was I happy about that? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so, but it was... Uh, God's love working in me 
and through me um, that drove me to uh, say, yeah, uh, I have a wife and I have two young children and they need a, they need a house to live in, they need food to uh, nourish them, uh, and they need a family life that will nourish them emotionally, yeah. spiritually, mentally, yeah. you know, my, that whole thing. My spiritual director at Franciscan was a permanent deacon. Oh, he was? Yeah, yeah. And he, yeah. he had a wife, yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and um, one of the things that, uh, well, that, that leads us back to uh, the two orders. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I am one of the fortunate ones that have been able to receive all seven sacraments. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> all seven. Something, that's not something everyone can say. Um, no, it, most it's people, true. Most people cannot say. Right. right? Permanent deacons and then uh, the, the rare priest in the Roman Rite who's transferred over from another rite. Right, correct. Uh, and then the Eastern Rite, uh, right. some Eastern Rite priests as well. So, uh, in a way, this answers another question that was given to us was, uh, the Catechism states that holy orders of matrimony are directed towards the salvation of others. Uh, and that's in paragraph 1534. Um, do you see a connection between this idea and the two of the great tragedies of recent decades? Right. And that was, I don't know if we've had a mass exodus of men from the priesthood, um, that's the but we certainly the had an exodus <laughs> yes. of men, not necessarily leaving the priesthood as priests, although they have, mm -hmm. unfortunately. But also just um, diminishing numbers, joining seminaries. Right, yeah. seeing and religious orders. seminarians go in and leaving the order. Um, but we certainly know of the skyrocketing divorce rates. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you didn't hear, too, when I was a kid back in the 1950s, you really didn't hear too much about divorce. Mm. It was hush hush. Nobody nobody talked about it. I mean, if somebody in your family got divorced, you might not have even known about it, mm. you know, for a while. Yeah. You know, um, nobody talked about it, at least to the younger, right. younger people. Um, but today, you know about it right away. So we know that the numbers, and we do know that the numbers have increased. So I wonder what the rates of cohabitation as opposed to marriage are. I mean, they're surely higher than they were decades ago. People choosing to cohabitate rather than get married. My yeah. guess is that they would be higher than they were a few decades ago. I would assume, um, I would assume that, but, uh, you know, I, can do, I can't assume a number like I could do like a quick that. Google search yeah. on my phone. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I don't know if that's really that important. I think yeah. the big thing is, you know, if the two sacraments are directed towards salvation, mm -hmm. then what went wrong? I mean, why wasn't it? And I think that you hit the nail on the head mm -hmm. when you talked about love. Right. Uh, when you talked about what's in it for me? What happiness yeah. am I going to get out of this? Mm -hmm. I mean, when you talk to uh, uh, individuals in therapy, the, you've got to run into you know this uh, me, myself, and I attitude of, oh, woe is me, and I'm not getting this mm. out of, you know, certain things, and this is why I did mm. this, I think, and, um, and some, the, so, somewhat, I was, I've been surprised in, in therapy to find not that much of the selfish kind of attitude. The thing I come across more of is scrupulosity. Okay. Um, but I do think, I think what gets people the thing is, people who come to therapy come because they they know that something's off. Yeah. So if someone's coming for addiction, it's because they recognize that that something's off and needs to change. So they they they're usually beyond that um, self indul uh, indulging phase. The yeah. other thing is, though, I think that uh, it's. I'm just going to say, with addiction, there's um, there's a tendency to uh, judge the people who get addicted because the thought is how. You know, how could you choose drugs over the family or drugs over your, your spouse? Uh, but addiction is just so indiscriminate. Yeah. And the way that it affects the brain, it takes away, uh, it takes away a large portion of the person's free will on a biological level. Right. The way that it you know, and I think, so, that you, I think you're hitting on something, too, as far as um, skyrocketing divorce rates. Mm -hmm. um, I think in divorces... You may have one party out of the two that 
are struggling either with addictions, struggling with their own behaviors, right. yes. um, don't know how to control themselves. Yes. There has been a skyrocketing um, of mental health issues. It, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, um, and typically it will end up in a divorce court. Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully it doesn't. I mean, we pray for those who are close to that. Uh, we pray for their healing and uh, healing as a couple. Um, I don't see that same typical issue with um, young men leaving the priesthood, even older men leaving the priesthood, uh, guys who have been around for a while. Um, but I can see in a way um, that selfishness, when we are concerned more with ourselves than with others, can lead us to... Uh, other issues that could be the cause of leaving. Mm. Um, but it still mm -hmm. might be a selfishness. Whereas yes. a selfless person, um, especially in marriages, I can see, I can really atone to marriages. Uh, it, you know, I don't know whether priests leaving the priesthood are leaving because they want to get married or, be, uh, or for whatever reason. Mm. But I, but as, a deacon, I would have no reason to leave the diaconate. Huh. Um, but there are a lot of things that can distract us from having a loving marriage. Hmm. You know, and, and a lot of that ends up stemming from a selfishness. But selflessness allows the individuals within the marriage especially to learn how to compromise. Right. You know, if there's, if there's one thing that needs to be done is that compromising attitude. Um, you know, the, the catechism talks about that with, um, you know, about who's the head of the household. Are, are, are men supposed to, you know, be dominant over the women? And no, that is not the case. The church has never said anything like that. So it really requires um, this. You started out talking about the greatest of all the virtues, love. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that love will drive us all towards uh, where we should be with either one of these sacraments. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. Yeah. It has to be focused on God first, neighbor second, and then, then myself. Yeah. Right. Um, there's another question here that is really funny. Um, I, sort of, I sort of looked at this question and I said, uh, well, last Sunday I was ordained as an extraordinary minister of the Eucharist so that I can bring Holy Communion to the sick. What's wrong with this statement? Yeah. Well, pretty, it's a <laughs> well, pretty, pretty simple answer. Yeah, it is a pretty simple answer, but it's sort of hilarious. Yeah. Um, and no, you're not ordained to... Uh, become an extraordinary minister of the Eucharist. Right. Um, you are appointed, and that actually has to go through the bishop. Hmm. So we're talking about, here's the three orders. You can't, you can't just go to your pastor. Right. He, he will be the first front line to say, yeah, but, I, but, yeah, but, and I have to talk to mm -hmm. the bishop. You have to send it up to the bishop's office. He reviews it, hmm. and then it gets sent back to the parish level. Um, where yeah. the individual yeah. can become an extraordinary minister. Right, right. Um, it's not that way with a lector, but it is that way with an extraordinary minister of the Eucharist. I sort of found that. Um, right. Here's another question that we have. all ears. And you, um, you might be able to answer this one. Um, in uh, number 1545, um, the relationship between the redemptive sacrifice of Christ and the Eucharist is linked to the relationship between the one priesthood of Christ and the ministerial priesthood. Hmm. What's, what's so similar? Yeah, well, let's define some terms first. So the redemptive sacrifice of Christ, what is that sacrifice of Calvary? He died on the cross for us, and it's redemptive because it saves us for, from our sins. So as St. Paul says, Christ died once for all for our sins. Okay, good. What's the Eucharist? The Eucharist is the memorial of Christ's passion, death, and resurrection. It is the rendering present of the once-for-all sacrifice in time for us every single day. So Christ died once, and yet he is made present again in his sacrifice every single day mm. 
on the altar. Okay, so the theme for the first one is redemptive sacrifice happened once, but it's made present to us on multiple times. The one priesthood of Christ. Christ is the high priest. What is, what's a priest to do? A priest offers sacrifice for the atonement of sins. Even the pagans have that notion of what a priest is, right? And the Jews did, and then Jesus fulfilled uh, the priesthood in his one sacrifice. So he is the high in the, priest. In the order of Melchizedek. In the order of Melchizedek. Yeah. Right? Because Melchizedek offered bread and wine in the Old Testament, and likewise yeah. Jesus offers his body and blood in exactly. bread and wine. Yes. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> but, um, so he's the priest. Yeah. The ministerial priesthood are participants and sharers in Christ's one priesthood. So yeah. just as the Eucharist, through the Eucharist, we share in the once-for-all sacrifice of Christ, the ministerial priests share in the one priesthood of Jesus. Um, and that, that gets a little bit, in, that gets very much into in persona Christi Capitis, but we'll, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, I mean, we're not too far off from really uh, uh, having to talk about that. I mean, so... How do the rest of the faithful, because we read in Scripture mm -hmm. that you belong to the holy priesthood um, of, of God, the royal priesthood mm -hmm. of God. Um, and Peter, in his letter, yeah. was basically speaking to every Christian, you know. Yes. Um, and so what's the difference there? I mean, how is that different from uh, the exercise of the ministerial priesthood? Uh, you know, because some people yeah. will ask that question. Right. Well, and, and I heard in a podcast recently, it was a Jordan Peterson podcast. He was interviewing, a, 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 I believe he was a Protestant from India. He might not have identified denomination. But uh, what was said in the podcast is that Luther emphasized the um, universal priesthood of all. Yeah. And there's a misunderstanding there. Because the Catholic Church also emphasizes the universal priesthood of all, insofar as we are all made sharers in Christ's priesthood through the offering up of our sacrifices, the offering up of our prayers. Because again, what's a priest? A priest is someone who offers sacrifice for the atonement of sins. Mm -hmm. So all of us who are baptized into Christ are able to unite our sufferings and our sacrifices to the Lord's eternal sacrifice on Calvary, the difference between that universal priesthood, which all the baptized Christians share in, and the ministerial priesthood, that is, the priests who are ordained, the difference there is that the ordained priest makes present the eternal sacrifice. Right. Without the priest to, like the ordained priest, I mean, to, to make the sacrifice present, our, uh, the lay faithful's priestly sacrifices would not have an outlet to be offered to God through. So at the Mass, during the offertory, we are joining our sacrifices and our prayers to the bread and wine which are about to be consecrated to the body and blood of Jesus. If the priest weren't there to do that, that wouldn't happen. So that's where the difference is between... Yeah. Um, you know, the Catechism speaks on that, and it talks about baptism twice. Mm -hmm. And it says the royal priesthood that every layperson belongs to, mm -hmm. the royal priesthood, exercises their baptismal grace by serving everybody in yes. the, in the in ways, the world, right? Right. Yeah. In in the ways of um, uh, charity, uh, in the ways of. Uh, uh, serving each other mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a special type of grace that we all receive at baptism to serve everyone mm -hmm. around us whereas the sacrament of holy orders it takes that baptismal grace and it perfects it to the point where mm -hmm. the priest is there to serve the people the yep. people yep um, yeah. with, in the person of Christ, you know, and that's a big, the big, I guess the big thing comes about this whole idea of in persona Christi Capitus, mm -hmm. you know. It does. Well, and the amazing thing about the ordained priest is that his sacrifice 
is it's because of him that we are able to offer Jesus to the Father. And Jesus condescends to us in order to be offered to the Father in time, every Mass, also from eternity, <laughs> yeah. through the hands of the priest. But it's because of the priest that the, the lay faithful are also able to make that sacrifice their own. So we can literally claim Calvary as our own sacrifice because of the ordained priest. And so it's, it's an act of adoration to God. And then what you said, too, it's an act of service uh, where God bestows his redemptive graces on us right. as well. Right. And so the service, here, here we go back to what we talked about initially, mm -hmm. was that both of these sacraments that are received are sacraments of service. You know, and this speaks to, um, as a question that was presented to us, my priest told me that, when he celebrates Mass, he acts in persona Christi Capitus in the person of Christ the head. How arrogant, how prideful. The Bible says that we're all sinners. My priest has faults just like I do. No priest is perfect. And so, how do we respond to that? And I would say that when the priest says Mass, he's not perfect. Right. He's a sinner. Mm -hmm. And when Mass begins, and we all go through the penitential rite, we go through that penitential rite for a reason. We ask God to forgive us all the venial sins, mm -hmm. all the sins that we've committed. Right. And we expect that when we receive communion, that the Eucharist itself is going to cleanse us perfectly with sanctifying grace. Mm -hmm. Sanctifying grace. So actual grace cleanses us, God forgives us, but that Eucharist cleanses us via sanctifying grace. Mm -hmm. That priest could be in mortal sin, God forbid, but he could be in mortal sin, but as long as the form, the proper form and the proper um, uh, accidents mm -hmm. are there, the bread and the wine, and the take this, this is my body, which will be given up for you, this is the cup of my blood, as long as he says those words, he is in persona Christi. He's not Jesus. Jesus is working through him. And he is there. It's very difficult to separate the two, but it's just like the Eucharist. How do you understand the bread to be Jesus as well as the bread? Mm. And how do you expect the priest to be in persona Christi. It's, remember when we talked about um, the Eucharist, we talked about the collapse of time, mm -hmm. you know, and how time collapses from where we're at right back to the Last Supper and the crucifix and dying on the cross and the resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. That whole time collapse thing is really why all of this works. So, in persona Christi doesn't have anything to do with the disposition of the soul of the priest. It has to do with the fact that he's doing exactly what he was told to do. Mm -hmm. He's been given the uh, grace of the orders, and it's the grace of the orders that gives him the in persona Christi yeah. as he acts there in confession, mm -hmm. when he goes to... Um, the hospital or to someone's home or to a nursing home or wherever to give um, uh, the anointing of the sick, okay? Mm -hmm. And in the case of uh, marriages, um, I'm not sure what they say about in persona Christi as far For as marriage? marriage because the couple marries the themselves. The couple marries themselves. And, um, the and, uh, and I'm not sure about because we're, we're more, we stand in more as uh, witnesses for the church under those particular sacraments. But without getting too fuzzy on this, this yeah. is, you know, the basis for in persona Christi. Yeah. Uh, regarding in persona Christi, God's made a covenant with the priest on the day of his ordination that when he, when he uh, performs the sacramental actions, with the proper form and the proper matter, that God will work his miracle 
regardless of the state of the priest. That's the covenant that's made on the day of ordination. And the other thing I, I wanted to say is that in confession or in reconciliation, the priest says, I absolve you. Yep. He's speaking as Jesus right. there. Yep. And so, yeah, I mean, in, in one sense, the priest is not Jesus. In the other sense, it seems to me too, too much maybe to say that Jesus is the priest there. Maybe too much to say that. But to say anything less seems too little. And so I don't think that we can express with words the union that happens in, in Persona Christi between right. the priest and, and Jesus the head. Right, exactly. It, it, like I said, it's yeah. very similar to the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't separate yeah. the two. I mean, the Eucharist is easier to put into words, though, because yeah. the Eucharist, we could say, yes, that that is Jesus. Right. Right? Under the appearance of bread and wine. Boom, right. done. Right. <laughs> but with... With this, it's, I, I don't know, yeah, it, it just... We trust right? the fact that 2,000 years, yeah. and I mean, we haven't really, we haven't really talked about, you know, um, the early fathers of the church, mm -hmm. uh, and I did that for a reason, yeah. <laughs> because we'd be here for two nights in a row, um, just talking about how the early fathers of the church dealt with, mm -hmm. um, you know, holy orders, okay. uh, and... Um, how it has virtually been unchanged to the basics and mm -hmm. specifics have been unchanged for two for two thousand yeah. years. Yeah. Um, so that being said, uh, you know what you were saying is absolutely mm -hmm. true. Yeah. You know uh, about you know the priesthood, but right. we go back to like Saint Ignatius mm -hmm. of Antioch. He wrote some of the most beautiful uh, writings about uh, the clergy, um, deacons, priests, and bishops. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't really talked too much about deacons, and here I am sitting as an ordained deacon. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, tell us about the hierarchy of the church, because there are some people who, they claim that the hierarchy of the church was just made up in the Middle Ages. Um, but yeah, no, no, it goes <laughs> all the way back. It goes all the way back there. I mean, you can take a look at the Acts of the Apostles yeah. when they chose uh, the deacons, and then they um, had to uh, they had to elect, and they called them either elders or presbyters. And from the word presbyter, we have priest. Right. You know, so it's always been three orders mm -hmm. um and uh we can go from uh the didache in 80 a.d and 110 a.d saint ignatius of antioch and irenaeus in 150 a.d and then go out to uh hippolytus um and uh the um uh, tradition of the uh, apostolic traditions yeah. um, we can look at Tertullian which was even earlier was around 250 AD 350 AD I mean every century there's been many 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 writings um, that point to uh, what does it take it takes the laying on of hands mm -hmm. by a bishop mm -hmm. you know so a priest can't lay his hands on it has to be right. someone who has been chosen mm -hmm. Uh, to be a bishop, and then consecrated as bishop. So there's three orders, and we say ordained, and, uh, it, you know, it doesn't matter to me. Um, you can't get reordained, but you are ordained to a different level. You know, so I don't get, re if I ever became a priest, which I wouldn't uh, at this point uh, in my life, but if I had ever been brought to the priesthood, it would have been, you know, ordained to the next level of uh, uh, being in the clergy. And the same thing with the bishop. Mm. Um, and in the very beginning, we have, uh, we have evidence. In fact, I did a little investigation because I wanted to make sure that my, uh, that my times were, were right. At one time, the deacon had become the uh, eyes and ears of the bishop. I mean, he was his mm. right hand. Wow. Oh, yeah. Um, it was never uh, it was never the deacon's job to be a table servant. Hmm. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of information about that. Um, they were in the first uh, 
millennium, uh, at least for the first half of the millennium, and even beyond that up until uh, about 1000 AD, um, deacons undertook what we call, as bishop's assistants today, the vicar general, the uh, judicial vicar, the vicar capitula, um, and the finance officers. Mm. You know, they were uh, those types of jobs yeah. were uh, they were delegated like administrative duties right? to the deacons. Yeah, to the deacons, they took care of those administrative duties so that the uh, priests could go out and do their their thing. Um, hmm. And at what, one, what time period was this? Um, this was in the first millennium. Wow. Okay. Uh, in fact, up until, I should say this, between 432 and 684 AD. So this is after the Milan okay. yeah, edict. You wow. know, this, is, yeah. this is halfway through the first millennium. Of the 37 men elected Pope between 432 and 684, only three are known to have been ordained to the priesthood before their election to the chair of Peter. Yeah, I knew that I knew that During there that was a number period. of them. Yeah, but I didn't know that there was that many. There were only three. There were only three that were priests before before they were pope. Before they were pope. Between four hundred and six eighty eight. Oh my word! Right, and so in the. In the early oh. church, <laughs> yeah, and this is one of the reasons why um, deacons got too much power and the presbyters, the priests, got Where, was resentful. It, was it often deacons who were elected pope? Often. Okay. Often. Okay. I mean, you know, if we take a look at um, uh, Athanasius, hmm. one of the most famous bishops during the, the Council of Nicaea, hmm. Before he was bishop? He was a deacon. He was a deacon. No way. Yeah, he was a deacon. That's too and funny. And some of his writings were when he was a deacon, and he was, uh, he was ordained to the deacon, and they elected him to be consecrated as bishop. Wow. But you can understand that when we understand what the deacons were originally course, used for. Right, they were leaders. They were, they were the right-hand man. Yeah. And so they knew exactly what was going on mm. in that particular order. Sure. Um, they probably had a better idea than the priests. Um, to be honest with you, um, I know that things have changed over time and that the Holy Spirit directs the church. And uh, I would be the first one to say that whatever time it was, that the church was probably led down the right road, uh, even, even with men messing around with it, sinful men messing around with stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but I always thought, especially when I was studying for the diaconate, that priests should walk away from, or the church should help priests walk away from all of the stuff that mm. vicar generals do. I, I don't think that there should be a priest in the chancery, <laughs> honestly. And it has nothing to do with, I don't think that they belong there, or I think that deacons would do a better job. Because priests are ordained to bring all the sacraments, except holy orders, all the sacraments yeah. to the people. So you're saying that should, that, that the should be their duty. primary focus. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, to, you know, at one time, um, the church was uh, blessed with an abundance mm -hmm. of priests. And, um, and that maybe was fine to have a chancery full of priests, monsignors, mm -hmm. you know, and really, you know, they probably got out and did private masses, many of them back in the day when they could do private masses, but how many of them were put into uh, parish situations, uh, going to nursing homes and doing this and doing that. I just think that they would they would have been better served mm. or God's people would have been better served had they had the opportunity. This is a personal opinion. Um, there are plenty of... I like personal opinions. Deacons, uh, permanent deacons, who um, can handle the jobs that go on 
in the chanceries um, and uh, could be held trustworthy, uh, could work directly with and for the bishops just like they did in the first millennium. Um, will it cause problems going forward? Who knows? Uh, I, you know, personally, I'm happy where I'm at. Um, I'm happy that I, I would be able to, I would love to be able to go out and um, uh, bring the anointing of the sick to people. Mm. You know, could, being up there doing Mass, uh, if I was ever made a priest, I could do that, and I would love doing that, and I would love being there. And I, I love the priests, especially the priests that we have here on the island. Mm -hmm. My pastor, uh, my pastor emeritus, uh, very close friends, and uh, very holy men, generous men for doing what they do. Um, but I'm happy at what I'm doing. Um, I wish that I could bring the sacrament of the sick to people, because I would definitely do that, uh, because my heart, my heart is open to doing something like that, bringing God's love. Um, but it's not the way that it's set up right now. And, um, you know, sometimes people come to me and uh, will ask me, can, you know, I, can I pray over them? I, I can pray over you, but I can't give you the anointing. You know, if I, if I bless you with oil, that is holy oil blessed by the, mm. all it is is a blessing. And my praying over you, that's all that it is. Um, mm. It's not like the anointing of the sick, which is a sacrament. And that can only be done by a priest or a bishop that is a priest. Um, mm. Funny thing is, is that uh, I wonder back in the day, I would assume that they became a priest as well. That they became a priest and a bishop. You know, from being a deacon, they would become yeah, a priest know. and bishop right away. Right. And then all of a sudden, a pope as well. Yeah. Um, and that brings up... I have a... Sure. Uh, I was wondering if we could bring it to marriage because we're, we got 20 minutes left. Yeah, sure we can. And since I thought that we might talk this about celibacy a little bit as well. But, but well, yeah, I mean, that yeah. might be a good idea. Yeah. Um, we could sure. talk to it just briefly. Uh, yeah, uh, you can feel free to ask your question then and... and um, well, it's not so much a question, um, you know, the, we, we've had, uh, we have two valid, uh, priestly lines, one in the Latin, mm -hmm. right, and one in the Orthodox, right, um, and one, uh, brought about mandatory celibacy. Mm -hmm. And the other one kept what it was originally. Um, optional. Which it was optional. Mm -hmm. But not for bishops. Right, bishops had. And, and that intrigued me um, that even in the Eastern Orthodox, that they broke away from Paul's writings. It said uh, his letter to Titus and his letter to Timothy, in both of those, a bishop should be married once. And a presbyter should be married once, and a deacon should be married once. Um, so we have those those writings, and yet in the Eastern Orthodox, um, you cannot be a married bishop. Mm. You can be a married deacon. You can be a married uh, priest. At one time, you were able to. Um, wasn't Saint Wasn't Saint Paul <clears throat> maybe saying you should not get married more than once? Not not saying you have to be married to be a bishop. Oh, but right. no, exactly, right. exactly. Right. Um, but basically what that attested to was... There are married bishops. Married bishops, right? yeah, which there were. Right, I mean, yeah. St. Peter, yeah. first pope. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it was the same thing with uh, uh, many uh, bishops, you know, down the ages. Um, there are several uh, saints that came out of the... Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh centuries, uh, that were all popes, and uh, one of them I think is Pope Sylvanus, hmm. was the son of another pope who was a saint, as well. So That's both funny. father and yeah. son were canonized, and they were both popes. They were both popes. Yeah. That's a lot of pressure to live up to. Mm. Boy. Because you can understand why That's some a legacy. Why some. In the Eastern Rite, would choose um, to be celibate, you know, to uh, uh, 
give their uh, priestly duties over to just, you know, mm. all their energy over to that. Um, but, you know, what do you think? Oh, boy. How do you feel? How do I feel? Yeah. Uh, what do I think about celibacy, you mean? Yeah. I think it's, I think it's great. <laughs> um, okay, well, let's see. Uh, I think that if God's given the grace of celibacy, Matthew chapter 19, uh, verse 12, Jesus says that there are those who made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on to say that uh, whoever can accept this ought to accept it, which would seem to indicate that he is uh, encouraging those who have the gift of celibacy to embrace it. St. Right. Paul, Paul similarly writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, um, he's writing about celibacy and marriage. <laughs> and St. Paul says, I wish you were all like me. I wish you all were celibate like me. <laughs> it's, it's funny. Yeah. It's funny the way he said but And then he says, but, I, but to some one gift is given, to others another gift is given. And now he's... Uh, so St. Paul's saying that for those who, who uh, have the gift of celibacy to pursue it, to embrace it because it's fruitful. Um, the gift of celibacy is a, a living out. In some ways, it's a living out of the eschatological union that we'll have with God at the end of time. It's a living out of that heavenly beatific vision here and now because it's a testament that I am wedded to God. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that, furthermore, I am radically available to the entire body of Christ. Not one woman, or if you're a woman, not one man, but, but to the entire body uh, in a self-donating way. Uh, and then for, for women in, in a way that bears life. So men would be self-donating, women would be life-bearing. I mean, there's elements of both in each, each of the yeah. sexes. But, and, and then just to kind of cap it off, where the... Um, it's also just a, it's a prophetic vision that uh, it's a testament of faith, that I have faith that this is not all there is. Mm. Um, and so marriage is an icon of the marriage of Jesus and his church and of the marriage that we'll all have with God in the kingdom of heaven. For those who have, the, who have been given the vocation or the calling of celibacy, to deny that call and to pursue instead the icon. The icon no longer becomes a window into eternity. Now it becomes uh, something that's actually, it could, it could, and God will bring you to him, but to not follow his call is a mistake. So I would say that when, when the person is not called to the icon, that image becomes something that he can become mm -hmm. attached to. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's an ideal. It's, it's a great ideal, mm -hmm. um, and we see, you know, the the left and the right lung, you know, the east and the and the west, mm -hmm. um, who practice it differently. Uh, we know that it was in the Second Lateran Council in 1039 that they uh, made celibacy in the west mandatory. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, it wasn't, although it was highly recommended. And we can go back to possibly around the 300s where we can where we have a lot of information you know about it being more and more uh, desirable um, so without going into it further I think that we need to see both lungs hmm. of uh, that working well you know yeah. in God's kingdom yeah. um, and and I pray for our celibate priests who have that desire that they are given the strength to self-donate every bit of time that they have mm -hmm. to God because their holiness is important in the world. Every ounce of holiness that, um, that we can muster is um, a weapon against the evil one mm -hmm. um, who we are battling day in and day out. And um, the fewer people we have to battle, the worse that situation is going to get over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see a lot of that in um, in marriages yeah. today. So I want to ask yeah. a question about marriage. <clears throat> Tell me, Deacon Fran, about your experience with uh, prayer with your wife 
and how that has benefited you, and then also the elements of spiritual warfare in the marriage. Just kind of broadly uh, that's, free range. Yeah, that's a real, that's a br real broad range because um, if it wasn't for my wife, um, I don't know where I'd be today. Um, mm -hmm. If it wasn't for her spirituality, if it wasn't for her um, coming back to her faith, um, I don't know if I would be where I'm at right now. Th that would be the first thing. And so we see the cooperation. What, what's so important, what I think is so important with uh, young men coming into the priesthood that are celibate, they're going to be bachelors. And I can tell you, you ain't going to make it on your own. Right. You have got to stay close to a deanery. You've got to stay close to a community of at least another person, mm -hmm. you know, who you can trust, who, uh, who isn't afraid to come up to you and tell you that, you know, that you're doing this right and that wrong, mm -hmm. um, who uh, you are accountable to mm -hmm. uh, on an equal basis. Um, you know, uh, our prayer lives... Um, don't necessarily cross each other's paths every day, but I know uh, that while I'm here working or I'm at church praying, uh, if my wife isn't at church praying, she's at home praying, uh, praying the Stations of the Cross or praying uh, the Rosary. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, when she gets into it, um, I, I, she's told me in the past, I brought her home the uh, St. Jude Novena that I do every Monday night. Um, and so she'll, she'll do that from mm. time to time. Um, do we pray a lot together? Only when we're in church, typically, sometimes at home uh, we will. Um, but it's having that life based on Christ, knowing that Christ lives between us, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that Christ is at the center of our marriage. Do you think it's important for couples to pray together? Yes, I do. Yeah. Uh, uh, if not praying together, it's knowing that we're praying with each other and for each other, even if we aren't together. Mm -hmm. I mean, how does that happen with a guy who's on the road all the time? Mm -hmm. uh, or a woman who's on the road all the time? You know, nowadays, you know, we can't uh, push either aside and say that the woman is always home or the man is always home. Uh, both could be at home. Mm -hmm. And that would be maybe an ideal situation. Um, <clears throat> I'm still okay with the stereotyping. Yeah. Which you wouldn't expect to hear from a therapist, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, it's a crazy world that we live in. Yeah. Uh, many women that I know that are working that have to make a living. Um, there are some women that have to go out and work because their husbands are sick. Yeah. You know. You know oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's um, the single parent, single parent homes is also another... Uh, complicated factor there. I know? think I think when uh, you know when we talk about praying, you know, sometimes people think that um, praying together is praying the Rosary together, or praying the Our Father together, or mm -hmm. praying this. Um, when we talk about God together, when we um, mm -hmm. talk about our life situation. And it's always God-centered, Christ-centered. Sure. You know, um, you know, we need to uh, talk to God about this or that, about our family. Um, I think that you end up praying at that point. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where uh, much of uh, my prayer life with my wife centers around. It's just sharing uh, our deep commitment. First to Christ, mm. then to Holy Mother Church. And hopefully that just spreads outward, you know, flows outward to all those that are around us. Um, my children, my grandchildren, my friends. Uh, and some of it's going to stick, mm. you know. And that's what's kept my marriage together for 49 years. Mm. Um, and I think that it could do well for a lot of people. But it has to be, you know, both. Um, and so the idea of praying together, yeah. Whatever your form of praying to God and being with God, having God in the center of your life, we, we won't go anywhere uh, out to dinner 
and sit down to break bread someplace where we don't say grace first. That's everywhere. At home, mm -hmm. out at a restaurant, yeah. you know, wherever it might be. Um, For sure. And so it's little things like that that just uh, let me know and let Donna know that, you know, our life is Christ-centered mm -hmm. and it's going to remain that way. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when we watch TV, you know, we agree on so much, you know, as, especially when it comes to faith and morals. Mm -hmm. You know, we're just, we're there. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a fact. Now, on the other hand, there's too many problems um, that crop up uh, in marriages where mm -hmm. you could have one person who, in the marriage, it's a Buddhist. Maybe the, maybe the marriage, well, n uh, you know, I wouldn't worry about too much about a Buddhist affecting a Catholic who needs to practice her faith mm. or his faith. I would worry more about the one who sits back and just gives a hard time mm. to the individual about their faith, mm -hmm. you know, and loving God. You know, that, uh, and that brings up the Pauline and Petrine uh, uh, things about people getting married that, you know, in certain instances, a marriage is good where there are different faiths because it might bring mm. the other faith, you know, as long as the Catholic That's is right. staying. But, that, but I, it, this isn't the point that I want to get at because we only have a few more minutes. And you need the bishop's approval to do that anyhow, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah it all, that all goes through um, the diocese. You know, the, all the paperwork has to go up. And they have to check everything out before mm. it comes back. It normally takes uh, two or three weeks for that to happen. Mm. Um, now, I'm talking about situations where it could be one or it could be both in a marriage, and the marriage dissolves, and it becomes a problem. Whether it was both that were away from the faith, didn't care, mm. they were married in the church because mommy and daddy wanted them married in the church, they left the faith, uh, behind, uh, probably never uh, practiced it, ended up getting divorced, then one, or it could be even both, you know, have a reawakening of their faith. And now they want to get remarried because they found somebody. Mm. And this can happen in instances, mm. and it could be one person is abusive, right. mentally and worse, physically abusive with children mm -hmm. and for the sake of the children the wife goes to court or it could be vice versa but typically it's the other way around um, they get a divorce and the wife wants to get remarried because she found a loving person a loving husband what can they do because we know what Jesus taught about divorce or what we read in the scriptures. And the church has a pastoral way, and this is the last thing that I would like to uh, talk about, but I can't talk at length about it. Uh, and that is getting an annulment, and that is not a Catholic divorce. Um, an annulment basically says that um, understanding certain grounds that existed before the marriage, um, M declares the marriage null before it even happened. So a sacramental marriage might not even have happened when they take a look at mm -hmm. the divorce situations. And there's a number of things. I guess the real why I brought it up so late in the evening, I think that it's important that we bring this message to mm -hmm. those who we know. Um, if yeah. you go on in seminary, you'll learn a lot about this. Mm -hmm. Codes of canon law, there's a half a dozen codes that speak to various things um, that they look at in order to say, yeah, that marriage never really existed and that person is uh, free to marry. Right. You know, at that point within the church. And the whole, and it marriage. goes back to the idea of form and matter. Yes. And so if the sacrament, the in the Latin church, it's the husband and wife who marry each other. Right. And if there is not freedom, if they're not, if there's no freedom, or they uh, are assenting to something that they don't, 
they're ascending to something that they think is, but it's an illusion. Uh, that's not a free ascent right. of the will. Because there, marriage has a, to be a free. There's a bunch of them. There's a bunch of them. <laughs> and I've been but through, it goes, it goes I've been through many annulments in the last 20 years. I've done a number of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I will typically sit down with people and go through the questionnaires yep. and um, take a look at all the different codes of canon law that are associated mm -hmm. so that when their paperwork goes up to the tribunal, that um, everything is there. And I won't, you know, I won't mince words with the person who uh, is looking for an annulment, mm -hmm. um, you know, because, but I've never, I've never had one come to me that didn't have some sort of impediment mm -hmm. uh, that was there before the marriage happened. Mm -hmm. And that's why they all, uh, the annulments all came through. Okay, couple of things. Very good. Um, we won't let the people go quite yet. No. Um, it's summertime. The weather is getting beautiful. Um, and it's and hot in this church. <laughs> it is. Oh, it's hot. Gosh. Even though it looks like we're in the basement of this church, um, it's hot. It's There's no air conditioning. No. Um, but that is not the reason. We are taking, uh, for all the folks in Zoomland, we're taking a sabbatical for the rest of the summer and will not start up the um, from the heart of the church until September. Uh, and there's two reasons for that. It gives you some time off and us some time off um, during the summer. summer. Yeah. And I look forward to be able to sit on my uh, the deck of my pool at home with my wife, uh, <laughs> listening to music, enjoying God's beauty, um, and enjoying each other. Um, and, and I hope that uh, all of you are able to do the things that you would like to uh, do and be free on a, a Tuesday evening yeah. um, for this hour. Um, but also, we have a very interesting series coming up uh, called War and Faith. Um, and it's being presented to us uh, on the island. So this is probably only for the people uh, who can make it here in our area. But it'll be on Tuesday nights, and it'll be held live here. Uh, you can sign up for it. Uh, and it's being done by a professor uh, for 20, I want to say she's been a professor for 20 years in the War College. Mm. Uh, and she uh, presents what it's like in war uh, and f how our faith um, uh, is seen during times of war in and through art. Mm. You know, it could be music, it could be writings, it could be pictures, you know, oil paintings, yep. photographs. Uh, and she's going to start out with the Revolutionary War and work up through the Civil War, uh, mm -hmm. other wars. Mm -hmm. um, I forget some of them that she's going to do. I know World War I, World War II. Uh, probably uh, they will end up doing uh, um, the Vietnam War. And I think that there's going to be a couple of special ones that they do in between that are not necessarily wars, but uh, insurrections and things like that. So it should be very interesting, folks. Um, I would uh, take a look at the um, Enders Island website, uh, go out there and take a look for, uh, for that particular um, one-hour seminar that will be happening. And I think they're going to happen every two weeks, uh, starting in the month of July. Uh, but until then, <clears throat> we love you all for participating in the mm -hmm. From the Heart of the Church and our discussions each week. We hope that, um, that you've grown from uh, things that you've heard. Uh, certainly, uh, Christopher and uh, Bob, who is not with us, and myself, um, we learn a little bit more each week from each other uh, that we've gathered together. And uh, so let us thank the Lord uh, in particular for uh, just having a wonderful time over these last 16 sessions. And we hope to see you in the fall. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be upon you always and in all ways, and may he send give and make this day uh, full of his peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.